it was uh, a little bit of a surprise, that's for sure, uh, to to depart midseason. You know, looking back at it, there are some highs and lows, and the, you know, the highs were uh, uh, a podium finish in the top three in a sprint race. Um, you know, a, a podium in Monaco where, for example, uh, engine power has less of an effect. Uh, and and also a genuine top four qualifying for Pierre in in Barcelona, where aerodynamic efficiency is rewarded. So yeah, there there's there's some some highs that's for sure. Um, we also had you know two drivers that could consistently score points, which was which is also all, always good. I'm not saying we didn't have that with Fernando there. We had that as well. But I think it's just uh, it, it's really important to you know to have to have two competitive drivers, which uh, in getting in getting Pierre from uh, Alpha Tori uh, w- was useful, and you know I was in I was instrumental in doing that once we we realized that uh, both Fernando and Oscar were off. Can we talk about Oscar? Sure. Thoughts on that, um, regardless of whether how strong or not. The written contract was in fact you performed the contract and that's that must be the frustrating thing from your point of view yeah we we definitely performed the contract we uh you know there there was a, a crb test that uh landed on the side of oscar and mclaren but that's not the only test and um you know had we had we tested the contract in uh in the english courts because it was a um uh, it was governed by english law you know the outcome could have been much different than the CRB. Like you say, we performed, uh, Oscar didn't, um, from a CRB perspective, there was an out, but from an English law perspective, it could have been different, but the decision was made to not continue the fight and, and, you know, just let it be as, as it is. Um, and, and that's okay. That, you know, that was a decision that I did make. That was a decision that, uh, was made for me, um, but you, you know, I I wish Oscar well. You're absolutely right. He uh, he p- performed well uh, against Lando. I think to me, next year or the year after, will be more telling. Um, you know, you've got to give Oscar the 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 year of getting used to the team, the circuits with the car that's underneath him. Um, and then we'll, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll see. I think Lando is, uh, is exceptional and, uh, and, and you can see that in, in the comparison. Um, although, you know, everyone says, uh, Oscar did a good job because he did. Uh, I think Lando was still quite a ways ahead and not all races, but in total points and some of the head to head comparisons, but, you know, that's be- one of the reasons is, uh, because Oscar was a rookie. Rob, now looking back now at the whole Force India Racing Point Aston Martin period of your career, again, lots of highs and lows as well. Uh, let's talk about some of those highs. You nearly won that Belgian Grand Prix, should have won that Belgian Grand Prix. Uh, and then, of course, you did win with Sergio Perez in Bahrain in the end. Yeah, there's a few of them. I mean, with uh, Lance, I think, should have won in Turkey. He's so so far ahead. Uh, I think uh, Nico Hulkenberg should have won in Brazil. He was forty some seconds ahead. Yeah, and and he had the car underneath him to be forty seconds ahead. Uh, and, and then the uh, the safety car bunched everybody up. Lewis got him at the restart, and then the, a lap later, he tried to overtake Lewis in conditions where if you went offline you were worse off much worse off because it was damp right so the, the lines dry off lines damp you mm. and he just should have waited and got him because he had a much faster car we wouldn't have won that race anyways but and then looking back at Sergio's win in in uh, Bahrain I wouldn't have predicted it for the world when he was last, <laughs> you know, Leclerc ran into him. He came, he came back on track dead last. And you're thinking, ah, oh, 
it, it's there's no way. And we did get lucky at the end. I think George Russell had a puncture. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, without that, we probably would have been second and fourth. But with Russell's puncture, uh, that helped us. But, you know, you got you got to be there to make that to make that luck. You know what I mean? I mean, given that and how well that team went and then the transition to Aston Martin with the Strolls at that point, you would have thought that Otmar would have been staying on as team principal there for the next hundred years, really. I mean, you see, that was effectively a team that you'd been very much a part of for many years. How did it all come to an end and why? Well, Lawrence was successful in the past, very successful in his other businesses by hiring people that uh, have been successful elsewhere and bringing them along to his team. And as successful as I was at Force India with the smallest budget and the least amount of people, you know, finishing regularly fourth, in the championship and, and, you know, beating many teams that had more people and bigger budget. We weren't regular world champions or we, you know, we weren't world champions at all. Um, and we weren't regular winners or podium finishers. So he has this vision in his, uh, in his mind that he wanted those who have been there and done it. And and uh, he ended up recruiting uh, Martin Whitmarsh to take a big part of my job, and um, I guess I could have stayed there as as team principal and and done you know twenty percent of what I used to do. Uh, but to me, going racing and being team principal is the culmination of a lot of hard work, and I prefer you know most of the work's done at the factory. The culmination of it. Um, is at the racetrack. Um, and, you know, I, I prefer to do both and really to, to lead the team that develops the car and gives the car to the drivers, to, to me, is more satisfying because that's where, like I say, 80% of the work is done, uh, not just going racing. And looking back at it, I mean, I was, I was uh, uh, instrumental in recruiting uh, Dan Fallows, from uh, Red Bull. Uh, Andy Alessi also came from Red Bull before Dan did. Uh, Eric uh, Blanden from Mercedes. Uh, and there, there are some others from Mercedes too. Ian Gregg, who um, became head of Aero for a while before Dan Fallows got there. Um, so there, there, were, there were lots of uh, new recruits that I'm sure had a big impact on uh, the production of the car um, that came out in 2023, including Luca Fabrato, who I recruited from um, uh, Sauber or Alfa Romeo. I worked with Luca uh, in the BAR days, and he became engineering director and, and looked after, you know, things like uh, finite element analysis and R and D and all the elements that uh, help you in weight reduction. And if you remember when these new cars first came out, they're all overweight. Uh, and the quicker that you could remove weight, the, uh, the better off you were on, uh, in on track performance. And, uh, you know, Luca, Luca did a good job for them to make sure the car was underweight, you know, not so much aerodynamically, but there's also, if you can do a good job in FEA and mechanical design, you know, you, you can uh, design things that are aero enablers. So you enable better aerodynamics because of the uh, design ability that you, uh, that you have. And uh, Luca was instrumental in that. So uh, I recruited him as well. Uh, Mariano Alperin Rivera recruited him. He was a old friend from British American Racing. I hear he might be going somewhere else or maybe he's gone already. Um, a but yeah, a, a, a good, good, a good group of people, mm. and uh, 
we grew it probably to about 600 by the time I left from about 400 to 600. And I understand that they're, uh, you know, they're, they're much bigger than that, probably in the 800s now, 800 employees. Did you recruit people straight away for Alpine? I always had the philosophy of you shouldn't make change for the sake of change. You need to have a good understanding and make change in areas that you know are going to be better because you're changing them. And it's exactly what I did at Alpine. So I took some time, understood the areas that were lacking, and then started making changes. You know that uh, when I was when I got there, there was no separate uh, aero performance group, for example. And at the bigger teams, they have twenty to twenty-five people looking at aerodynamic performance, right? Which which is a separate group from the aero group. It's like uh, it's almost like a vehicle dynamics group, but focused on aero. And um, Alpine didn't have that. But by the time I left, I recruited the head, a, a new head of that group, um, uh, separated it from the aerodynamics group, and then started recruiting people underneath. So that's just one example. So Esteban Ocon finishes. As you say, you got some very good early season results. Finishes third at Monaco. You had some other very promising results, Barcelona. So what went wrong at Alpine? Again, you would imagine that you were well entrenched there. And this isn't just me saying it, but but many others saying that uh, we're going in the right direction. Um, you know, a, a a lot of a lot of praise internally, saying this is great. That we love your management style, what you're doing. You know, uh, changing things without disruption so adding not disrupting which uh you know it's a skill to make changes and not irritate everybody who's already there uh and you know have everyone see the fact that these changes are necessary and it's it's for the better of the team and you know i used to have i used to have uh monthly you know once a month i'd have lunch with bob bell who i have a lot of respect for yeah and I would ask him, you know, feedback because he's been around forever. He's been on world championship teams. And I would say, what do you think, Bob? You know, this place, um, the, you know, the, the things that I'm, I'm doing and proposing and changing. He said, absolutely. You're, you're doing absolutely the right stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, it was good just to have him as a sounding board because although he was not working for the Formula One team, he was in the he was in the office. Um, so he, and he had a good understanding. So I think we're, we're moving in the right direction. The, uh, um, the fact that the senior managers at, uh, Alpine wanted success, uh, much quicker than was possible is I think what went wrong. Um, and having explained that to them, that, it takes time and it takes time to recruit um, in the areas that need bolstering only because the best people are on two to three year contracts still. And what you want to do is get the best people that you can, not just anybody. So you have, you should wait for those contracts to run out, convince them to come and then it will for sure turn around, but it, it takes time. And as of late, you know, many, many teams, I mean, everybody knows it's, it's about teamwork. So when you have good people, you try to put them on the longest contract you can, so they don't leave you. And uh, e even if you can make a compelling case for some people to leave Red Bull and come to Alpine, which, which I did, um, it it takes time because of the of the contracts the employment contracts that they have and it seems like most of the big teams or maybe all the teams if you're on say a three-year three-year contract two years into it so a year to go hr will call you in and start negotiating your next three years and and that's how it works they don't leave it to oh you got a month to go and then by that time you've looked around, you've told other teams, I can, uh, you know, I can join you in the in a month if you actually want to leave. Uh, it doesn't happen that way anymore. It's a year before your contract's up, 
you start talking to the team that you're in, it, you know, for, for you to stay. So it becomes harder. The thing that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm disappointed in mainly is the fact that we had different timelines of, uh, of success. And, you know, I was, uh, I, I was given a hundred races, which I thought was enough because a hundred races at 25 per season is about four seasons. And at, 20 per season is around five. So it's in between four and five seasons. And I thought that was enough to go through a recruiting cycle of, even if people are on two, three year mm. notice periods that you can, you can still recruit them, get them, get them to work together and then have a chance in those outer years. And I was 33 races into it. And then, uh, the uh, the edict that we weren't making progress quickly enough came, and they wanted change. Which, for me, I know what it takes to 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 change the culture and the uh, uh, the the performance of a Formula One team. It just takes that time, and I've I've said it in the past. You know, people look at Aston and say, "Oh yeah, but look, Aston did it from one year to the next." They're seventh fastest team and the, and then at the beginning of 23 they were the second fastest team how, how could that happen in a year and no it didn't happen in a year all those recruits took time and it it was in the background that all this happened and we have to remember lawrence bought the team in 2018 and they had a quick car in 2023 right that's five years by my by my calculation it's actually four and a half because he bought in august of 23 but that's the time frame you know I, i've said it in the past mercedes bought braun a world championship winning team they didn't buy a mid mid-grid team they bought braun uh who won the world championship for reasons that we all remember the double diffuser and having a mercedes engine and some other things but nevertheless, they had the capability and they knew how they were winning. It took them five further years to win again. Red Bull bought Jag, mid-grid team. Stewart, Jag, Red Bull. Took them five years to win with Adrian Newey. It just takes time. It takes time. And uh, to, to think you can do it in a year or two is, uh, is naive. It, it just can't be done. Otmaram, I also, I, I may be incorrect here, but it looked from the outside as if you also brought commercial benefits to Alpine with BWT. It's yeah, what it so looks B like from the B outside, you're quite close to that company, right? Yeah, BWT decided, uh, you know, no, nothing to do with me to, to leave Aston, mainly because Aston was going from Racing Point, which was pink, that BWT like. To, to becoming green and I, and, I, and I get it from a brand perspective that you know Aston should be green uh, Ferrari should be red you know um, silver arrows are silver you know I get it so Aston when, when Aston became Aston out of racing point it was going to be green never pink and because of the greenness I think Andreas who loves his pink started looking which was well before I left um, well before I left Aston and he was talking to a few people and ended up at Alpine where I ended up going however when I was there and he was there then for sure our relationship that was so close helped in uh, making sure that the sponsorship was uh, beneficial for both sides now that I'm not there, I don't know what the future holds for them. But uh, you know, but, but I, like I said, I'm not there, so I can't help with uh, uh, w with making that uh, sponsorship beneficial for both sides. I also had, although I didn't recruit them, I think Cyril did. Um, I had a really good relationship with uh, BP Castro. They're they're good people. Uh, they do a, a, a very good job in. Uh, in both uh, lubricant performance as well as fuel performance. 
And uh, yeah, like I said, I, I looked after them well and had a good relationship with them. You mentioned earlier when you were talking about, in summary, your year, you were talking about Monaco, where the power deficiency of the of the car didn't didn't show through. That implies, of course, that there is maybe even now today a power deficiency. Where do you put the Renault engine? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, the the FIA have uh, the the FIA have all the uh, data, and I think it was at my uh, last ever Formula One Commission meeting, the you know the FIA put it on the agenda uh, because when the regulations, um, the, when the engine regulations were such that we had to freeze development in order for Red Bull to be able to use uh, a, a Honda engine that wasn't going to be developed. There was a, and I wasn't there for it, but there was a gentleman's agreement that said if, if the uh, if the powertrain output of all the manufacturers was a percentage uh, different, then they would start looking at what to do to bring everybody in line so that they're not more than I don't know if it was two percent or one and a half percent or one percent. I can't remember of difference and uh the fia themselves said oh yeah look we're outside of we're outside of 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 the the powertrain difference window we need to start talking about what we should do to bring the renault engine you know back in line with the with the rest of them and we had one meeting where i argued uh pretty hard on behalf of renault to uh, to get the other engine manufacturers to to do exactly what they promised when uh, when the engine freeze came up, uh, about, but you know uh, a gentleman's agreement in Formula One hmm. sometimes is uh, is worth having and other times not. But are you so suggesting it, that, that, get that, that discrepancy won't therefore be accounted for going into twenty four, or do you think things will happen over the winter? No, I, I I think it'll I think that discrepancy only because it's really hard to change now. I think that will that will stay uh probably until twenty six. So another two years, twenty four, twenty five. Even more reason to think how odd that they put so much pressure on instant results in terms of your stewardship, bearing in mind part of the problem was the power unit, which in reality is nothing to do with you whatsoever, right? No, well, it, yeah, I mean, we, we all worked as one team, but um, the, the, the powertrain discrepancy, the, the issue there was it's frozen. Y y even if you want to change it, y you're, you've got constraints. You can't. You can only make changes for reliability's sake. Um, and, and, you know, that doesn't give you much latitude to improve improve the uh the power output of the unit and that in itself uh if you have that deficiency um it's hard to overcome so for you to be competitive at the front of the grid uh, you need to have the chassis and the drivers and everything else be that much that much better than everyone else to make up for the powertrain deficiency and that's impossible